Welcome to Water Wizards, where we get inspired by the movers and shakers of the world. Those catalyzing change just like water. Episode one featuring Isha Patel. Oh, yay. I'm so excited. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Water Wizards. Get a glass of water and join us. I am with the amazing Isha Patel, and we're going to talk about some magical, magical things this evening. Well, it's morning for her. She's in Perth, Australia, on the other side of the world. It's 10 p.m. for me. This is the beauty of doing global business, right? Global mission. We get to connect with people on the other side of the world, and you're in for a treat tonight. Get your water, connect, take a moment and just breathe into your heart. Come into the now moment, turn off all the distractions, just be here with us now, be here with us now. So this is the inaugural episode of Water Wisdom. Isha didn't know, I didn't position it in that way. I didn't say, hey, will you be the first on my podcast I I saw later on when you posted it, I thought, (laughs) oh, how exciting. I, I, I feel honored, I feel honored to be chosen to be the first. It's actually very special. Oh my gosh. And you know what? It was so synchronistic. So before Mm -hmm. we dive in, um, I want to tell everyone how we connected because it's quite magical and still so new, so much unfolding and opening up. Like I can feel it in the field. It feels so delicious. So I don't even know how I found Isha. She ended up on my feed. I probably came across her in a group maybe and friended her. I don't know. I'm always looking for people who resonate and then you end up with all these friends and you know how Facebook plays with the algorithm. Certain people come, certain people go. And I saw Isha on my feed. I was just scrolling through and I was like, Ooh, who is this? So something, the good law of attraction called me in and I would read through her posts every once in a while. Um, but I didn't go do any activations or anything like that. I didn't check out her offerings or her YouTube channel but I felt a deep resonance with her. And then I went to bed one night and I woke up that morning and and my intuition said, you need to do a Lionsgate portal activation. And I was like, really? Because I've not done a lot of portal work on my own, yes, but I've never hosted an event around a portal activation date. And I went back to sleep that next night and I woke up the next day and I heard, but there's some preparation. And I told you this, I I had Mm -hmm. messaged you. I was like there, I said, this morning when I woke up, I got an intuition that I needed to do some preparation work around holding this container. I've done many containers before, but for this one, I needed some prep work. And then the first thing I saw when I got on Facebook was your post about hosting container for facilitators who are going to do something possibly um, around the Lionsgate um, portal date. And I was like, this is it. This is it. And I really didn't even read much into the post. I was just like, this is it. (laughs) And so I went into your container. I think that was eight, three for me. Mm -hmm. And we were all introducing ourselves. It was a lovely container, by the way. And you said, so Monica, how you, how did you find me? And I was like, well, I'm real sure. Blah, blah, blah. And you were like, well, surely you've done an activation or two. Right. And I was like, nope. I'm just here for it. This is the first. And so you facilitated an amazing container with facilitators of containers. Um, and it was magical. It felt very, um, very close to home for me because what I do is similar with my own unique soul blueprint as you have. Um, and then ever since then, your stuff keeps popping up for me. I keep feeling a call to you. And today I was binging your content because that's how I prep for my podcast as I binge the content. And it just felt so, so, so good and so aligned. So I'm so honored to have you as my very first guest. And you have a podcast called First Contact, which is amazing. Love the content. Um, I did post links to a couple of Isha's uh, offerings in the group here. And I'll reiterate that at the end. Um, but absolutely amazing work. You are an author, a healer, you have a lot of magic to offer. And so thank you for coming into this podcast, Water Wisdom, where I really want to talk to the catalysts. I want to talk to the way showers and I want to talk to them about 
how they started their mission work. I want to talk to you. I want you to share with us, um, you know, what was that spark and what pushed you into it? Because so many of us, like we get that spark, but we, some of us are like on the edge. It's like, what's that nudge that gets you to move into mission? So share with us, Isha, tell us a little bit about your story. Thank you so much. Firstly, that was the most amazing welcome. Thank you so much for all the wonderful things you've said. I'm I'm so grateful that we've connected as well. And and you know these things just they always happen in such beautiful, perfect timing. Um, that that Lions Gate event sold out within minutes. I think it really just like clicked for so many people. And it's the first and only event that I've run this year. I mean, I've been taking a bit of a hiatus for the last twelve months. So that was the only thing that I put up, and within minutes, it was like all the right people came in. So I'm really grateful that you were a part of that magic that was co-created there. Um, my story, I mean, I feel like it's such a big question. I almost want to ask the question back and say, where where in that journey do you want me to start? Because I've been doing this almost 10 years now. Um, and I guess at the very beginning of it, it was, it was really just um, like blind faith. You know, I was going in with just a desire, I guess, an intention. I do remember back then, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know if my stuff would even work. Um, I didn't even know that I was capable of doing the things that I that I ended up doing, but it really was that I wanted to serve. And I think that if we really go back to those, those you know, bare roots of how it all started, I remember one night just laying in bed and really just telling the universe, I am here, tell me what you want me to do, show me my purpose, how you want to use me in this life, and I will show up for that. And that that really was the the kickstarter to everything because literally then that night uh, I started channeling like spontaneously. So, wow. so well, that, I mean, that one intention. Sorry. How young? How young were you? How young you? was I? Oh, geez, uh, about twenty five at the time. About twenty five. Okay, so wow, not That's even, amazing. not even, probably like twenty four. I reckon it was yeah, probably about twenty four. So, were you born with gifts that you were conscious of? Look, not that I know of. A lot of people ask me this. They say, well, you know, some people just have it. And I'm like, well, not really. I mean, I've worked hard for that, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's what I always say to people as well. I mean, you know, some people are born with it. If you are lucky, you, you know, I wasn't one of them. So, so I have very diligently done daily practice day after day after day after day. Tens of thousands of hours have gone into this to get to the level of skill that I'm at now. And, and in that sense, it's also quite empowering for others to hear that because it means that anyone can do it. If I can do it and I wasn't born with anything special, it's just, it's something that can be learned. You know, I think all intuitive gifts, all of this galactic connection, it's a learned skill. I was just dedicated enough to put in the time because even yeah. before that moment, when I was 24 years old, I'd done light body activations for maybe three years prior to that. So I was already in that space. And I was, you know, I was that 19 year old that was paying for spiritual mentors. Like I was going out and driving an hour out to the hills every once a week to meet with a mentor of mine and coming back. And, and, you know, I, I put in the hours, I put in the work, I put in the dedication. And I think the universe really rewards you for that. Some people, you know, they do just wake up one day and, and it happens for them. And, and I did have a spontaneous overnight awakening, but sometimes people don't see the three years of hard work yeah. that went in before the spontaneous awakening, you know? So, so it definitely was, was a process for me. Uh, and, you know, people come to me and say, well, you know, how, how can I experience this? I'm like, well, it just, you know, this is the process that I use. I use the Merkaba light body activation and you can go find that on my YouTube channel. If you do it every day for 18 months, like I did, you'll probably get similar results. So I don't think it's rocket science. I think you just have to be willing and, and um, the intention is everything. I think that's probably my key message is that the intention is everything. Because the second I surrendered to the universe and said, I am ready and I will do whatever it takes. And I meant it. I meant that I would do whatever it takes. And I did do whatever it took. I had to let go of so much. You know, people don't realize that aspect of it. Like when you say you want to be in service to the planet, not just to, you know, your local community or to your family, but when you make a call that is so big and so bold and you say, I want to be in service to the whole planet and to the whole universe, show me what I need to do and who I need to become. It's a journey, man. It's a real big journey. Yeah, 
Absolutely. So were your parents spiritual? Well, it's, it's quite interesting, you know, and I think my upbringing definitely um, contributed to my spiritual openness, um, but they're actually quite religious. So my mom is Hindu. My dad is Muslim. My dad's not really practicing so much these days, um, but they came from very strong religious backgrounds. And actually that was a point of conflict in their marriage because the families were very like, you know, you have to marry within the same religion and the same caste. And so they were like the rebels of the family, you know, a Muslim marrying a Hindu that many years ago was considered very controversial, very rebellious. Um, both parents paid the price for that. They got shunned by family members. Like it was a really big deal. Um, and all of that sort of, you know, it, it led to them not putting those restrictions on us. And so because of that, because of their adversity, their challenges, we had a lot more freedom to explore. So they put us in Catholic schools when we were younger because they always felt that the religious schools would be a little bit more, you know, like around morals and values. And so they, instead of putting us in a public school, they put us in Catholic school, but they were Hindu and Muslim. So I'm growing up going to Hindu temples on the weekends. I'm seeing my dad doing his Muslim prayers. And then at school, I'm going to like confirmation and I never got baptized or anything. So I wouldn't take the, the sacrament, but I went to all the masses. I did all the hymn practices. So I had a very diverse upbringing when it came to religion. So then when I was around, I think late teens, early twenties, I was introduced to the Baha'i faith. And that really stood out for me at that point in time, because it was all about unity and, and their philosophy around independent investigation and around just really you know asking questions like there were a lot of elements in that that really stood out for me so I explored that for quite a number of years you know so I've got quite a lot of diversity when it comes to my explorations and then by the time I got to my mid-20s um, it was a lot easier for me to then branch out into this more I guess I don't even know what I don't even want to label it new age but just my my version of spirituality because I knew that there wasn't one correct pathway. I knew that the Hindus had their own thing. I knew the Muslims had their own thing. I knew the Christians had their own thing. I believe in Krishna. I believe in Christ. I believe in Muhammad. I believe in Baha'u'llah. I believe in you know all of these different sacred texts as all messengers of light and truth. And so when you get to the core of all of that, it's really, I mean, it's the golden rule, you know, just love everyone, love your neighbor. That's basically it. Right. Yes. And so when it came to, to my spiritual awakening, the journey is just, how can I love more? And, and it just became so simple from that point. Oh, I love that. It's all heart, isn't it? Hmm. Just get into it your is, heart. It is. And also Absolutely. having to accept people on their journey as well. Because then one of the challenges that came with that was, you know, suddenly I'm, I'm channeling these, you know, galactic beings and then, and then trying to tell my parents that I talked to these ETs you know, like that was a whole other ball game. So, so having, having, uh, having to put that compassion and love into practice, I think has also been a big part of that growth, knowing that not everyone is going to understand, not everyone's going to be on that same page. You know, I have these experiences with galactic beings. And so my spiritual practice has led me into this expansion of consciousness where everything is living and breathing. And we are definitely not alone in this universe. And I know that so, so deeply now, you know, I connect with angelic beings. I do connect with Christ as well. Christ appears in my dreams, has been since I was a teenager. So I connect with Christ. Krishna has appeared to me in my dreams many times. Lakshmi has appeared to me in my dreams. And every time she pops in, I make a lot of money. I can tell you, she's the oh, goddess of a awesome. So I always make a lot of money when that happens. Yeah, um, I so it. I just I feel all these energies, you know, and for me, it's all, it's all love. It's all there for you to explore, you know, and if other people aren't on that same journey, because I think this is one of the things you maybe you can relate to this, Monica. Um, sometimes one of the things that holds people back from really stepping forward in that mission is they think, what will my family think? What will yeah. my friends think? You know, and, and this really is 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 to these people who might be on that sort of um, that that edge where they're going, well, I'm, I'm receiving these messages. I'm receiving these guidances. But but my friends will think I'm crazy if I say that. I have no logical reason to say that, or I, I don't have any background for this. Where am I getting these messages from? And the biggest thing I can say is just, just trust it. There's more, there's more to this universe than I think we will ever understand in this one lifetime. But if you are receiving messages or little intuitive nudges, 
when you follow that, the doorways just start to open. And that's 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 what I did. I just set the intention. One door opened, I walked through. Another door opened, I walked through. A few other doors closed behind me and I had to just let them go, you know. Yeah. But then you keep walking forward and forward and forward. And here I am almost 10 years later. And um, it's just, it's such a beautiful life, you know. Like, I'm just so grateful. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that is one of the biggest shifts that really helped me was to just focus on one door at a time, one brick at a time. Mm. And the acknowledgement that like you lay a brick, you got to lay the brick first and the divine will match you. And I think a lot of people look at mission as a mountain instead of one Mm. step at a time. You know, when Mm. we really do get to drop back into the simplicity of just one intuitive nudge at a time that takes you closer and closer to your mission, don't try and like fear cast. What is everyone going to think? You know, when I'm like out of the closet with my alien contact or whatever your gifts are. It doesn't all have to come out at once. And it was very indirect for me. You know, I really, Mm -hmm. when I went online, um, I did have that fear of thinking like, what are the people I went to high school going to think? And, and what are my family going to think? But I didn't just come all out at once that, you know, I'm having visions of Jesus and Mary Magdalene kind of dripped on people for a little while because that's what my nervous system could tolerate. That's Mm -hmm. important. You know, we, it's okay to take baby steps. You don't have to leap all at once, but the important thing is to like take the baby step because it will all be revealed one foot. Sometimes the the baby step also feels like a leap though. And I just want to really acknowledge that as well. Very true. (laughs) Cause I look back on it now and I realize they were baby steps, but at the time they felt like huge leaps. Huge. Yes. That is a very, very good point. Absolutely. (laughs) Thank you for acknowledging that. Um, okay. So let's talk about, you said you kind of had a spontaneous awakening and I think you said it was around 25 where you started channeling. Can you share a little bit about that experience with us? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'd I'd set this really powerful intention to the universe, you know, like the floodgates just kind of opened after that. And yeah, I was just laying in bed late that night and I, I just couldn't really sleep. And um yeah next minute I just get this this energy and I I couldn't even really contain it at that time you know um and and I understand what you mean about you know the the nervous system because it was like my my body my system just couldn't handle that that influx and so I really I had to be in this trance-like state to even be able to channel like I had to kind of get myself and my mind out of the way to even allow that energy to come through I do do things very differently these days which I can speak into a little bit more if you want to but um, but back then that's the way that I was able to do it because, because it's just when the conscious mind was there, it, it kind of would have blocked that energy, you know, so I almost had to surrender, get myself out of the way. And then it, it really felt like my mind was just like in this like little corner, like it had like shrunk into the corner of my, my brain. And then the rest of it was being opened up for this energy, this other energy to come through. And so I was still, I was consciously aware but very much in a trance-like state. I had enough wherewithal to go, you know what? I'm probably not going to remember what comes through. So I got my phone out and I recorded it because <laughs> um, it, it sort of, it, it started just kind of happening and, and all this energy was coming. He's like, I don't know what's going on. I'm like, oh, I'm, I don't even know if I can process this in, in real time. So I'm going to record it and then I'll listen back to it later. <laughs> you know? That's um, awesome. So I, so I actually recorded it on my phone at the time. And it, this whole thing lasted maybe, I don't know, five, seven minutes. It wasn't a huge thing. Uh, but it was the Mayan elders. They were the very first group that came through to me. And it's interesting because they're not a group I really have a lot of connection with these days. They they sort of were the ones that opened the doorway. And then I didn't really see them again for a long time. So, so they, they opened that pathway up. And then, um, I mean, that was the first experience. I can't even remember now what was said. This was years and years ago. I don't remember what the message was. But it was just something like, like, you're here to do this work. like, And I think really it was at that time almost like a, a test message to see if I could even get the message, you know. So there wasn't yeah. anything like super profound in that. It was really just like a like a little bit of a download for a few minutes and then it stopped. And I was like, oh, my God, that was like crazy. <laughs> you know, like what just happened? And then, and then, you know, that's when the mind kind of kicks back in because then I, then for days I was thinking, am I going crazy? Do I need to go see a psychiatrist? Like you know, like what's going on here. Um, and I, I'll be honest with you. I didn't even really know the concept of channeling. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like I was sitting there going on YouTube, listening to other channelers or anything like that. I, I didn't even know really what channeling was. I had come across the idea of channeling 
probably just maybe a couple of weeks before that, two, three weeks before. Um, and that's when I realized that channeling was even a thing. So this was very new. The concept it entirely was new for me. And then there I was doing it. And I was wow. like, ah, oh, this is a bit nuts. Like, what do I do? Who could I speak to? This is crazy. You know, so it really took a long time to integrate that. So what did you do? Who did you reach out to? Do you remember? You know what? There was a there was a channeler in Perth. Um, and I believe, yeah, not too long after that experience, I went along to a couple of her workshops and she used to do these, um, these like evening sessions in the hills. Um, and I just, I just started going along to them and I had a few sessions, like a, a few one-on-one -on -one sessions with her as well, just to kind of like talk things through. Cause I was going through such a big life transition at that point as well. And then all of this spiritual stuff was happening alongside that. And I just thought, my God, I need, I need some support. And so she offered uh, like a channeling counseling type of session thing so I remember going along to a few of those sessions and um, just yeah getting that one-on-one -on -one guidance and really making that time to to get it and she she said to me as well she said it's it's in your energy field I can see it. you're ready to channel and I'm like yeah I know I'm already doing it you know and at one point she was like um, she she invited me to channel in her group but I just said no because I was like so scared <laughs> but she was like you can do it she's like why don't you come up and just channel with me and I'm like no <laughs> um but then then what did happen from there actually you're really taking me back into my memory bank here Monica because it's such a long time ago um <laughs> I met a group of people from that circle so that that group of us that used to meet at these these weekly channeling events there was a small handful of people that I met from that group and I ended up meeting up with them on a weekly basis for probably like a whole year or more uh, maybe even up to two years and so every Wednesday night, we used to meet together in a small group, about five or six people. And that's where I started channeling. So it was in a very safe space. Every week I would go, we just, you know, have a cup of tea. And it was just like friends coming together. And then that would be my practice space. So every Wednesday I was getting this experience to, to practice my channeling. And they were so grateful for it. They loved sitting in the energy and it was, you know, it was a really nice experience for them as well. Um, and after doing that for, for 12 months, that's when I, at the end of that following year, I held my very first live channeling event at my studio. And that's when I went public with the whole thing. Because up until that point, it was just, I would channel for my friends and that was it. You know, I wouldn't do it in front of anyone. I didn't tell my family about it. It was just like this little gift that I had. Um, but I think, I think I needed that time to really hone the gift as well, to make sure that I was in the right frequency and, and get more comfortable with the whole process of it as well. So that whole thing took me about a year before I decided, okay, now I feel ready to publicly run an event. And I did it actually at my, I had an open day at my studio that I was hosting. And, um, yeah, I asked all of those friends to be there. I said, you guys are going to sit in the front row where I can see you. And if I don't see everybody else in the background, it's fine. You know, I had about 20 or so people that came along to this thing and I just got my friends in the front row and I said, I'm just going to look at you guys and pretend it's just like a Wednesday night. That's how That's I did awesome. it. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> oh, I love it. Thank you for sharing that. So tell us about what your channeling experience is like. What is it like for you? Are you seeing? Is it just a knowing? Are you actually hearing a voice? And how has it evolved for you? Yeah, so so the the evolution has definitely been a, a very drastic change from what it was then to what it is now. The experience back then was very much like I'm getting out of the way and the energy is coming through me, and then I would just start speaking. I wouldn't even really hear it; like everything was happening in real time. So the energy would just go through my crown, out my mouth before I could even like I I, I couldn't even control it really. Like I wouldn't be able to filter the words coming out or anything like that. It would just come out. You know, so it was a very like, um, it was a very trusting sort of experience, you know, if I have to put a word on it, because, because I'm trusting that the energy that's coming through is actually for starters benevolent, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that, and that the words that come out are truthful. And I think that's where the Wednesday sessions really helped me because I kept getting that, that validation and the verification, because I would say things that would like come true or that were true for other people. And so I really then started to, to trust that energy that was coming through, um, and as as that practice evolved, one of my big things, very, very big things is around discernment. I don't want any and every entity just entering my body. That's not cool. So 
So I wanted to be very clear on who the energy is, where they're from, you know, and that's when I started to really get to know the difference in frequencies. Like, mm-hmm. uh, is it an Arcturian energy? Is it a Pleiadian energy? Is it an angelic energy that's coming through? Who is that, that frequency, right? Yeah. Um, but something interesting happened after about two years of doing this. I, I met with another mentor, a spiritual mentor, a friend of mine, and she taught me this, this technique of going into your, your inner heart space. And when I learned that practice, that that took things to like a whole other level of refinement because before I was just activating my light body and then I would channel and it was all coming in through the crown and through the third eye. But when I learned to really go into my heart space and you know, we all we all have this inner heart portal within us. It's a beautiful garden space that we all have access to. And when I discovered that space and that method of connecting, the way that I was channeling shifted quite dramatically because then the beings came to me inside my inner heart space. But then instead of entering my body, they started teaching me about sovereignty. And this is where things got very interesting because they said, you know what, in the highest vibrational form of communication, we would never enter your body. Mm. We will allow you to have your sovereignty, be in your own energy. And if you need to receive a message from us, we can tell you in this form and then you can relay the message to your clients or to your community. So that's when I really started transitioning out of trans channeling because I realized as well, and this is where my discernment game was really strong. I used to, every time I channeled something, I would put my own energetic discernment practices in to check the frequency of that. And and when I was trans channeling, there was just a lot more room for, for just little teeny threads of um, distortions to come in. Mm-hmm. And so really, really started being quite mindful of that. And, and after doing that quite a number of times, I decided that I was no longer going to trans channel in that same way, but I would go through the heart portal instead. And if any messages need to come through, I can then relay that while still maintaining my, my bodily sovereignty and my energetic sovereignty. So the, the energies were no longer taking over my energy the way that they were previously, but I would be able to communicate with them. And that just opened up a whole other realm or way of doing things because I was I was a lot more I don't I don't like the word control but for lack of a better word I was I was more in charge of what was happening I was able to discern I was able to actually check the frequency of things so when I was working with clients I could absolutely know that there was a level of energetic integrity in the work that I was doing because I'd be constantly self-checking you know and I think it's such a big part of that practice that that when you when you expand your consciousness and your awareness to then connecting with these these beings, you have to know always who are you connecting with, what frequency they are. Because the thing is, things can get dicey in the space too. And I I don't want to pretend that everything's love and light because it's not. Right. There is a lot of love and light. Don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. but it's not all that. Because the same way that like here here on planet Earth, ninety five percent of humans are amazing right? They're good hearted, they're pure, they do the right thing, even though we make mistakes and have traumas and whatever, we're overall good people. Then you get the very small percentage who maliciously want to do bad things and don't really have that that conscience. Now, if we have that here on earth, what's to say that can't happen in other frequencies as well, right? Right, right. So, so there are a very, it's a very small percentage of beings who aren't necessarily uh, very evolved, and and to be fair, I have a lot of compassion for those beings too, because a lot of them are evolving just like us. We're all right. in transition. We're all evolving and learning and growing. And do I want those beings in my energy field? <laughs> you know? yeah. Like that's that's the question. And so like I can I can send love to those beings, but I don't necessarily want them entering my crown chakra because if I just open the floodgates and everything can come through or well, anything will come through, you know, and yes, there's, there, there's ways that you can stop that from happening and you can, you know, do frequency things and whatever. But for me, it was really just that that understanding of, OK, this is my body. This is sovereign. I will not allow other energies into this space. This is my temple. It is for me. And if beings want to communicate with me and through me, they can do that through the dedicated space in my inner heart garden 
garden where I'm allowing those energies to meet with me and they can relay whatever they want to relay. And what that also does is it allows me to, to have that discernment because if a being comes in and I'm like, hmm, I don't know, I want to check that frequency, I get the opportunity to check it before I pass on any messages, you know? So it really yes. allowed me to, to hold a higher level of integrity in my own frequency and also what I was then relaying to clients and, and people around me as well. That's amazing. Do you teach this technique? Yeah, going that's, into your that's heart? whole mentoring. Yeah, that's like all of my group programs. Uh, it's a big part of the origin activation training program as well, because when I teach facilitators how to, um, you know, how to hold space for others, it's all done through that, that inner heart gateway. And there's a, there's a huge philosophy built around it as well. Um, basically, what happened was, so a few months after I started running these sort of groups, I decided to put on an energy sharing circle. And at the time, you know, it really was just a, a bunch of people around town who were various energetic practitioners. So Reiki, we had uh, uh, access bars, we had uh, just like multiple modalities. And I thought it would be cool if we all came together and just did a bit of a, like a session swap, you know? So, yeah. so I just started running these groups, but then what happened from the very first session was I suddenly started channeling all this information. This was before, before the inner heart thing. So I was in like a trance channel at that point. And I, I just had like all these recordings of, of basically what became the origin activation philosophy. And, and some of the key points that my guide said to me was things like, everybody's already whole stop treating people as broken mm. you know they, they gave me the philosophy like the biggest the biggest thing that they taught me was when when healers have that that interaction with a client what often happens is and this is very unconscious it happens at very deep unconscious level of of, of energy is they set themselves up in one person is the healer and one person is the being healed right, right. And the number one thing they said to me was that needs to stop. That needs to stop because what's actually happening is the person is healing themselves and you are being the space for that. And they, they yes. very distinctly define the difference between holding space and being space. They, they said, you don't even hold space. You don't even hold space. You become the space and they do the healing. So I'm not healing anyone, you know? Yeah, um, absolutely. So that, that was like the core, you know, one of the core philosophies behind origin activation and then at that time, uh, it was called multidimensional frequency technique, but that was too much of a mouthful. So I eventually changed it to origin activation. Uh, it's not very marketable, um, but that's what it is. It's multidimensional frequency technique, which is going into the zero point because in the zero point is where all healing happens. You, mm -hmm. you access the zero point and there's many ways that you can do this, but I discovered that through the inner heart portal is one of the most efficient and effective ways of doing this. So what I did then was I created the philosophy and, and intertwined that with the methodologies that I had picked up over the years to, to create this facilitator's training, which is now known as origin activation. That's amazing. I love it. I love what you say um, just about the heart you know, the heart is the portal. Um, I have made it a huge practice of mine to not ask anything unless I'm in my heart. And mm -hmm. when you speak of sovereignty, that is huge too. I, I never really referred to myself as a healer, rather a healing facilitator. And now with what you're saying, I don't even know if that's appropriate, really. You know, like I'm not healing you. I'm just, I am just uh, holding I am just sharing a space with you so that you can heal yourself. I'm just shining a light. I'm just mm -hmm. shining a light is what I'm doing. And your point about sovereignty, I had an experience where I was dealing with an energy that was less than light. And it was because I did, I wasn't in my heart. I didn't ask. I didn't drop mm -hmm. into my heart. Like my ego was like, I'm doing this. And it was yeah. very early in the yeah. journey for me. And I ended up engaging with, um, a being not fully in the light. And it was revealed to me through dreams, uh, maybe shoot, not quite a year into engaging a lot with this person. And I was like, oh my gosh, it, it scared me. It, it scared me into sovereignty. It yeah. was, and I felt it was, it was very heartbreaking at first, but I, I feel more sovereign than I have ever felt and know that I will not go back to that space. And really it, it pushed me into being much more intentional about always dropping into the heart, always dropping into the heart. And something that it, it pushed me to do or catalyzed me to do was I too, I've never trans channeled, but energies 
will come in to my field and I will feel them. I feel everything. And then there's a knowing. I don't hear a voice or anything like that. I just, I have a knowing. And these energies would come in and I would feel them in different parts of my body, but I didn't know what the energy was. And so I was like, okay, if you're going to come into my field, I want to know who you are. And so I started asking whenever an energy would come in, I would feel them in a particular space in my body. I would say, who is it? And then it would be revealed to me. And so, um, for instance, Mary Magdalene, I always feel on my right side here. Jesus, I feel on my left. Lyran energy is like a crown. Arcturian energy is like a crown around the back of my head. So those are just a few of the energies that I feel come in. But I love what you say about like, no, you know, sovereignty is king. Sovereignty is queen. You know, we are sovereign beings. The heart is the portal. Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. Thank you so much. (laughs) That was so, so beautiful. Absolutely amazing. Okay. All right. So um, what else? So, okay. So this is the next question. I want you to tell me, you know, once you started channeling at 25 like, and, and you received the information that you had a specific, specific mission and it was time to start your mission, what were your, what were the steps? You know, did you start something in the physical first? You didn't go online first. Like what was the first step that you took to move into doing your mission work? For me, it started off as downloads of sacred geometry. So I would just, um, I'd started going to a meditation group on a, on a Thursday night and just, I was at one of these particular evenings and suddenly I just got this flash of this, this geometry that came through and I just felt straight away, I need to draw this. And it was a very specific triangle based geometry. It had 27 little circles in it, like very, very specific, you know, all the dimensions and the angles and everything. Like it just came through with a huge level of level of precision. And it was all to do with like Trinity energy. So, you know, the angles were all to do with 27s and just everything was very precise. Um, and then over the next few days, I would just be like walking or doing whatever. And I would just get these flashes of these symbols. And so I started just drawing them on just like a little notebook. And then I, I mean, I didn't really have any graphic design skills. I just jumped on Microsoft Word and I used their little, you know, lines and squares and stuff to make up these shapes, how I'd seen them. And I just invited people to join me for a ceremony. And at, at, like I knew I, I had enough information that I knew that it was a sacred geometry and I knew that it was connected with the, the 12 DNA strands, like the etheric DNA. So I, I got that piece of it, but really I didn't know how it worked. I didn't know really what it was going to do. I didn't even know if it was going to work. Um, and so I just, I put it up on Facebook. I just said, Hey, I'm running this thing. If anyone wants to come, it's a sacred geometry DNA activation ceremony um and people came (laughs) they paid me $15 to come to this thing and you know I just I was so ready to refund them I just thought if it doesn't work I'll just give them money back (laughs) um but actually what happened that night we had seven seven people that attended uh my very first event I had no experience facilitating I'd never done a Reiki course never done any training whatsoever in this um basically just had my own meditation practice which I've been doing for years and decided that I would lead this this ceremony and I never even attended any activation ceremonies or anything like that. So I just put this out there. I said, I've got these codes. I've got this thing. If anyone wants to come, we'll do it. Three people in the room on that very first event saw and felt this Arcturian starship that came in. And I was just like blown away. I was like, oh my God, it works. You know? That's amazing. I was just as surprised as them. Trust me. <laughs> I love it. How cool that's is that? I mean I... by the blind faith though. Like that's just, oh. that was me just throwing myself in. And this happened all within. So from the night that I started trans channeling that night in bed to running this thing was probably like a month, five weeks, maybe not even. So it, it happened like very quickly, you know, Um, because I've read, that would have been like, if I get my time frames right. Yeah. Yeah. Probably about a, a month a month between receiving it, put it, making it, putting up the event, running the thing was like a month. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. So this feels very synchronistic because I too did something similar. One of the first kind of type of downloads that I would get was sacred geometry. 
Mm, and I would draw it. Victorian way of communicating. <laughs> oh, I like it. I love it. And what I did too, is I started a group and I charged, it was $22 to yeah. come in. I don't even remember what I did. It was some, some sort of meditative practice. I don't remember, but um, th- I love that. That feels very synchronistic. And I was, I was terrified that nobody was going to come, but something in me just said, just do it. Like, just do it. Just lay the brick, create a graphic, throw it out there. I think it mm-hmm. recently popped up on my memories. It was about three years ago, maybe two and a half years ago. And I did, I created a graphic, $22 come hang. And I think I had about seven to 10 people that came in. So, you know, you just move through the fear, just move through the fear because those who are meant to come will come. Right. And then I don't think I even had time to be afraid. I think I was just like accelerating so quickly through all of this. If I'd actually stopped to think about it, I probably would have freaked out. You know, I think, (laughs) I think maybe, maybe it was because I was so young or like, you know, just, just, I don't know, spontaneous, whatever. Like I just, I didn't even process it. I think I remember a few years later, like probably I'm talking four or five years down the track. I looked back on that and went, damn, that was nuts. Like who does that? You know, like who actually does that? Yeah. I, I laugh about it now, but I think at that point in time, I was one, I think I was really guided. Like, I think I just really had all of this inner guidance yeah. um, that I wasn't fully aware of at the time, but true. I think I just, I mean, I'd gone through such a big life transition at that point. I'd, I'd come out of a relationship. I'd moved back in home with my parents. I'd dropped out of my uni degree. I did eventually go back and finish that. But everything was just in flux. And I thought, well, you know what? I've got nothing to lose here. I'm just going to do the thing. And if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You know, either way, I get to hang out with my friends for an evening and so be it, you know? So so the fact that something did happen was kind of like the, the cherry on top because I really, my expectations were very low, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was That's just awesome. that that experimental kind of kind of um I guess energy behind it where I was like I'm just gonna try it and see what happens and I think that's where a lot of people you know they they're not willing to do that sometimes because they want to know oh will it work am I certain about this I had no certainty around anything in my life I yeah. didn't even know where I was gonna be the following week I could have been on a plane somewhere to another you know country or like like everything was up in the air so much I thought, you know what, I'm just going to do the thing. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, you got to just give things a go sometimes. And that's what I did. And, and I got lucky, I guess, or I was guided or whatever in that it worked. Um, But I certainly didn't know that it was going to at the time that I did it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, what's magical too, about engaging with other people's energies and their um, intuition is we all have, we all have all of the intuitions but some of them are stronger in others than in us for me anyway. Like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a feeler and a knower, Mm. but then I engage with people who are seers. And so they come into a group. I do an activation and afterwards, you know, we're talking about like, what did you experience? And they're painting this amazing picture. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, that is so next level. And it's, it's a constant affirmation that just builds that, that inner trust and enhances your abilities, your super senses. So it, I like it. It's like one of those things you just, you just kind of have to receive the nudge and just jump, just jump. Right. They say jump and the net will appear. I've jumped enough times in my life that I know that with a lot of certainty, there's always a net somewhere. It doesn't always look like the way that you think it's going to look. And I think that's where people get a little bit you know, scared in that regard. Um, but I really, I really genuinely believe the universe has your best at heart. It wants you to succeed. It wants you to evolve. It wants you to grow. You really can't get it too wrong. You know, as long as you're going in with a positive intention, with a pure heart, sometimes, mm-hmm. yes, you might learn some difficult lessons along the way, but even that, you know, you can, you can ask, and this is what I always do. I always ask, please teach me with love and please teach me with kindness. I'm happy to learn anything I need to learn. I'm happy to evolve in any way that I need to evolve. I will do whatever it takes. I've said that many, many, many times, um, but just in a loving way, you know, and that I really carry that through the way that I run my sessions and my healing, my facilitators trainings as well, because a lot of um, modalities and practices out there, they're very really like, cathartic like and I've, I've done that too I've done all like a tantra and stuff where I'm like screaming on the table and you know <laughs> and after a while I'm just I just was like you know what that's exhausting like I just I can I can learn this in a better way I can learn this in a more loving in a, a way that's kind on my energy field that's not going to re-traumatize my nervous system you know 
Um, so I think that's been a really big part of it as well as like letting yourself move through those awarenesses with gentleness, kind of like, like the rose that just unblossoms or the, or the lily that just unfolds so gently, you know, if you were to force it apart, you would destroy it, you know, mm-hmm. like, and it's just, it's not necessary. The rose is going to blossom. You're all beautiful roses. You're all going to bloom. Just let yourself bloom, you know, give yourself yeah. the right fertilizer, the right water, give yourself sunshine, you know, in a metaphorical and practical sense, get out and actually get your feet on the grass and yeah. you know, get some sunshine. But then also, you know, have mentors, have a community, have people that you can trust, that you can talk to about this stuff, because those things fertilize your growth. You know, when you when you give yourself those things like. For me, I mean, like I said, I was paying for mentors at 19, you know, I was, I was investing in myself at such a young age. So by the time I got to my mid twenties, I was ready to go. I was ready to facilitate because I started so, so early. Um, But also at the same time, you know, even if you're in your sixties, you can still start today. You can, you can give yourself the opportunity to, to trust because the universe wants you to expand. It wants you to grow. And it's just, it's like, it's waiting for you to say yes. And when you do, suddenly mountains will move. Everything will will shift. And it's not always the easiest journey. I'm not going to sugarcoat it at all. There are challenges, you know, there's bravery, there's courage required to, to really live your mission. But my God, those rewards and that bliss and that connectedness is just, it's phenomenal. Oh, absolutely. You know, the consistent intentional actions that we take Mm. to say yes to the energy, to going into the quantum field. You know, I'm, my practices every day between the healing work and my own individual practices, I'm tuning into energies an average of three hours a day. And so it's like a muscle. I mean, it's really like a muscle. It didn't happen overnight for me. And so every day I take my time, I meditate and do what you're nudged toward. Like my soul said it's time for breath work and I, I'm totally addicted and breath work is taking me to places that I never thought was possible. So listen to the nudge and, and take the consistent intentional action every single day. You know, one inaction, we'll call it one inaction at a time, like one meditation at a time, just do it. And, and you will be led, you will be led through love, through love and mm-hmm. kindness. I, I like that through love and kindness, gentle experiences. Okay, so before we go, there are a couple more questions I have for you. And this group is all about water. We are the water wizards. I am actually in a Kangen water distributor. So Kangen water is what really guides my mission. And I was called to the water before I got into Kangen water. And I'm always connecting with water. I actually had an experience last night. The more I say yes to the spirit of water, the element of water, the more it reveals to me. But last night I was laying in bed and I was meditating and I saw this kind of gel, like these gel kind of bubbles come in and it was water and water was coming to me in that space between solid and liquid. That like transformational space you know, before water crystallizes. And it was like a field cleansing is the, I don't really know what it was, but it felt really good. And we don't really have to know, right? We just get to trust and stay in our heart. And so I would love to know how has water played a role in your journey? Has it been significant for you aside from obviously drinking and bathing, those types of things? One of my very early channelings, you know, when I said I was doing that group every, every week. Um, So water was one of the things that really came through quite strongly in those channelings. And they always said to me that, that, that would be a very significant piece of humanity's evolution. You know why? I mean, we're 70% water, right? And it's just, you know, the way that water carries memory and carries emotion. I mean, you're probably familiar with Emoto's work around the, you know, the frequencies of water and the experiment, like the rice experiment. Um, So water for me is, it's, you know, it's it's such a beautiful medium because it's, it's, I mean, we drink it, but it's also in the air, like water particles are in the air all the time. And so I feel like they play such a big role in the, the, 
uh, transmutation of, of consciousness, you know, like even we talk about like telepathy or we talk about, you know, intention, water can carry all of those things. It, it has that memory component. It has that ability to really, you know, help us connect. And so I got shown years ago that that water would play such a really big role. So it is something I'm very mindful about. And I'm, I'm extremely picky about the water that I drink. <laughs> so I'm one of those water snobs. Um, when I, when I bought my house last year, literally one of the first things we did, actually the very first thing was I bought a sauna. I got myself a, a proper commercial sauna in the house because I love that. And then the second thing I did was we got the entire house filtered from point of entry. So even our showers, like everything is completely filtered in this house because here, so um, in this particular pocket of Perth that I'm in, we actually have very hard water in our taps and you can measure that quite easily. Like there's a lot of um, like calcium deposits and um, just chlorine. And I, I wouldn't want to drink that fluoride, you know, they fluoridate our water here in Western Australia, which I don't like. Um, so yeah, we got a point of entry filter system and then also a secondary system as well that does all the fluoride for the drinking water as well. So we have a double filter system in the house. So anything Beautiful. that we drink is, is you know, there's no chloride in it. There's no calcium deposits in it. Um, and, then, and then our small filter puts some of the good minerals back in, but also takes out the fluoride. So very, very oh, picky about perfect. what we drink. Yeah. And also bathing because your skin absorbs water. You know, I mean, and I like long showers, I will admit, you know, I like my long hot showers. <laughs> so, so if I'm going to be standing in that water for, you know, like 10 minutes, whatever, um, I really want to make sure that my skin is absorbing good quality water that doesn't have all that chloride and stuff in it. Because, um, I mean, it, your skin absorbs chloride within seconds, you know, within Absolutely. Seconds, you, you breathe it in, water. goes into your lungs, immediately into your bloodstream. That's beautiful. Yeah. I love it. So something that I did. Uh, a couple nights ago, I've been doing some experiments with water and I took a cup of water and I just held the cup over my heart and I asked my heart to speak to the water. I asked the water to listen to my heart and I just imagined it's all about intention, right? I saw in my mind, my heart feel just wrapping around and around and around and around um, the cup of water. And then I took it and I stuck it in my freezer um, in a little Petri dish for a while and oh my goodness it crystallized into a heart you could see that the water was oh like God. restructuring so I will post a picture in the group so that you all can see that and I'll send the picture to you Isha um before we go I want to show you something something that I also did is I took a little petri dish of water and I pulled up your YouTube channel and I hit your one of your playlists that was the chakras a lot of you know going through all the chakras and I sat the petri dish next to the phone and I set the intention you know please show us a picture you know with the vibration of Isha just kept it pretty open I was like here just take the vibe take the vibe and create something beautiful so I want to screen share with you what I saw Wow, I'm excited. I haven't done this experiment before. This is great. <laughs> so check this out. So this, you can see now I was called to kind of alt, like darken it a little bit so we could see it. So I messed, I just turned the, the um, contrast up mm -hmm. and I'm going to see if I can kind of zoom in here. So this is, must've been like right where the volume, you know, where the um, sound of your voice was moving this, this kind of distinct circle here, mm -hmm. but I'm seeing, I'll send this picture to you. This, I'm seeing angelic, something angelic here. Do you kind of see this shape here? And then let's see it in the lighter state. Oh, yeah. See, in that one, I can see it very and clearly. It, like, now, do you see... Wings. Yeah. yeah. Do you see it where it's like restructuring? Mm -hmm. So I, I even see like an eye right there. So I'm like, if I would have let it play even longer and I let it play for like three hours, I wonder what it would have turned out to be. Um, but right. I thought that would just be something cool, you know, something Which different. Which of the videos was that? Was that the full chakra activation on the YouTube or? Um, you know what? I think I played like the first three 
on the playlist that has the chakras. It starts ah, with. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the root, yeah. the sacral and the solar plexus, right? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So isn't that interesting? So that's fun. I'm going to do that for the next wow. one too. And hopefully it comes out different. <laughs> that's really cool. Whatever. That's really cool. cool. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I'll send those pictures to you. I've never had anyone do that experiment on my activations before. That's you know, I was I, I was laying in bed last night and it just came through. It came through. Take a petri dish, sit up by the phone, and see what comes out. So wow. something fun and different. Wow. Okay. Tell us how we can access your work before we go. Yeah. So I at a link moment. to YouTube and your um and your website that I'll post. Yes. Yeah. So my website, um, ishapatel.com. Um, otherwise, yeah, my YouTube is where I've got a few things happening at the moment. We've got the first contact podcast. So my work this year has really been focused around teaching people that, you know, essentially we don't need to wait for a government disclosure because these beings are always here. They're always around. You can just connect with them through your heart portal. It's all here for you. Um, so I've been interviewing a lot of uh, industry experts like Arby Loeb, Dr. Sean Hagens. There's been some amazing, amazing, very top experts in the field. So that's all over on the YouTube channel and you can find it on Spotify and anywhere else that you listen to podcasts. Um, I'm most active actually in my Facebook group. So if you search for first contact in Facebook, you'll find it says first contact with Isha Patel. We've got about 3000 people in there and we like to have some nice discussions and I post activations and all sorts of fun stuff in there. So definitely come and join us in the community over there. Absolutely. And I'll post a link to that group as well in the description here afterwards. So amazing. Thank you so much for being my first guest. I think this was just perfect. So magical. I so appreciate your time. Thank you. Yes. I'm honored to be the first. It's great. Absolutely amazing. This was fun. This was so fun. Well, have a great day. I'll have a great night. You have a great day. And I look forward to connecting with you again. Thank you so much, Monica. It's a pleasure. Bye, Isha. Thank you so much for joining us for episode one of the Water Wisdom Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please like, share, and subscribe. And to learn more about how I support all of my mission work, Kong and Water, check the description.